yesterday's prophecies for today's world. But greater is he who is in you than he who is in this world. The Holy Spirit dwells in every believer and he is in you and you need not be afraid. And now, Hal Lindsey's Bible study of the book of John. 1 John chapter 1 says, if we say that we have no sin, we're a liar. And he's talking about Christians. Or even worse than that, you confess the sin, but you don't believe God. Then you got two sins. The sin you committed in the first place, and the sin of not believing God's word when he says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. What does that last phrase mean? All unrighteousness. Well, you see, if you confess what you know, and the word homilageo, translated confess, means to say the same thing about something as God does. What does God say about our sins? He says, number one, it's sin. Agree with him. Number two, he says, it's forgiven. Agree with him there, too. So if we confess, it means you have to know. what you're, You can't just say and forgive us all our sins at last. How many times have I heard my, my parents say that? because that was just sort of a customary thing in the South to say. And they'd pray, and then at the end, it was my parents, actually, it was my grandmother. But she would say at the end of the prayer, and forgive us all our sins at last. Well, if he doesn't forgive them now, he's not going to forgive them at last. But the problem is this. God forgives when we agree specifically with him, okay? But if you confess what you know, he forgives the sins in your life you don't even know about. And that's what it means when it says he forgives us all our unrighteousness. You follow me? So isn't it beautiful to be bathed and only have to have your feet washed? Well, that's what these, let's go back to chapter 2 now, that's what these earthen jars were for, to hold the water to cleanse your feet <clears throat> when you come in the house. So already, we know that it's important to our walk with Christ. All right? But then, Jesus tells the attendants, take those water jars, all six of them, and fill them to the brim with water. And so, they did. They took and they filled these earthen jars with water to the brim. And when they did that, a great miracle took place. Now, once again, you see in the Sameon, there are, there are applications at every point. What, is water, what does water symbolize in the Scripture, especially in John? It, it can symbolize God's word. It can actually symbolize several things. It can symbolize God's word. What else? The Holy Spirit. It can symbolize cleansing. But in this case, I believe it's very clear what it means. Turn with me to John chapter 7 in verse 37. Now on the last day... The great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out, saying, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, and this time the word believe is in the present tense, which means what? Something that continues. He who keeps on believing in me. You see, this is talking about an experience in your Christian life. He who keeps on believing in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. The Spirit was not given 
because Jesus had not yet been raised from the dead. He hadn't paid for sin and then been raised from the dead. That's when uh, 50 days after the crucifixion, on the day of Pentecost, he sent the Holy Spirit. This is explaining what was going to happen after Pentecost. And so he, he shows that water here is very much a symbol of the Holy Spirit in us, coming out of our innermost being. Now, I'm going to share something with you I rarely ever share. Because you're a select group that I'm around a lot, I'm going to share something that's very precious to me. You know, back when I was a young believer, and I mean a very young believer, I guess I would, I'd been a believer for about a year and a half. Uh, I had come to know the Lord in New Orleans as the tugboat captain, and uh, I had quit that job in order to try to find some people who really believed in Jesus. I wanted a fellowship with people that acted like the people in the book of Acts. I didn't know what a hard job that was going to be to find them. But anyway, I, I came back to my home from New Orleans. My home is Houston, so I was in Houston. And by this time, I was, uh, I was uh, studying every, virtually every night at a church called Baraka Church under a great teacher named Bob Thiem. Those days, he was the greatest teacher I ever heard. And uh, so uh, he was teaching about being filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, during this time, I went off with some friends who literally drugged me to another church, and they were talking about how important it was to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I got kind of confused because... You know, they, uh, this group, they kind of followed me around their thing. They said, you know, you can't be filled with the Spirit unless you speak in tongues. And so, you know, I was willing to, to do anything. Speak in tongues? Okay. I want, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I wasn't throwing up any roadblocks. And I remember praying in anguish, praying so fervently, that I would be filled with the Holy Spirit because I believe that that was really important. And it is. The Scripture says you cannot live the Christian life unless you learn to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so I tried to babble and things like that. <laughs> it didn't work. And uh, then I heard uh, Pastor Bob Thiem say That's, that stuff is for the birds. is probably demonic. And so I heard about that and you know, and he, he had some very theor theoretical teaching on it. It was very good about what it means to be filled with the Spirit. But none of it seemed to grab hold of me. So I studied everything that I could find on how the Holy Spirit works or is supposed to work in our Christian lives once we become a Christian. And uh, this so consumed me for about a week, I couldn't think about anything else. And I, I just said, I'm not giving up, Lord, until I am able to experience this. I will never forget, I was driving along the Buffalo Bayou coming from downtown Houston. Uh, there was a parkway that went along there from downtown over to Katy Highway. And I was going that way to get to my house. And while I was driving along there, I was thinking about this. And all of a sudden, these verses from John 7, 37 through 39, kept coming to mind. And I kept thinking about it and praying about it. And I just said, well, Lord, he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. I'm thirsty. And I'm coming to you, Jesus, for you to fill me with the Holy Spirit. And you say, believe. I believe you. I, I know that if someone really wants to have the power of the Holy Spirit in his life and the cleansing effect of the Holy Spirit being in control of my life, I know that you'll give it to him if you believe. I believe you. And all of a sudden, Scripture just started rolling out of my mouth. 
involuntarily. Just verses after verses after verses just kept rolling out of my mouth. I wasn't speaking in tongues. The living word was coming out of my mouth. And there, there was an experience there that, you know, I'm going to tell you exactly because no one has the same experience. You don't go by the experience. You go by the fact that you believe God and you know that there's only one way to live the life that he has for us. But I know that it was a divine appointment. I know that I, I entered a new dimension. Not that I don't fail, not that I don't sin. Of course you do. Every time you consciously and knowingly sin in the Christian life, you grieve the Holy Spirit and he will grieve you until you confess the sin and you walk depending upon him again. But I know from that moment on, my life took on a new dimension because I had not knowing what in the world I was doing. I'd been filled with the Holy Spirit. And the evidence to me was just the Bible rolling out of my mouth. Verse of praise, verses, from, you know, I hadn't memorized, but just living water coming out of my mouth. Here in Psalm 104, verse 15, it says, And wine which makes man's heart glad, so that he makes his face glisten with oil and food which sustains man's heart. It shows that wine is a symbol of joy in a man's heart. And there are many verses on that. Another one, Ecclesiastes 9, 7. Go then, eat your bread in happiness and drink your wine with a cheerful heart, for God has already approved your works. The symbol, like water, is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Wine can be a symbol of a life that's overflowing with joy. And so I believe that the great lesson he, John wants us to get out of this is any old pot will do <laughs> to manifest forth the glory of God. You see, these earthen vessels were used to manifest the glory of God the first time he worked a miracle. And so any old pot will do to manifest forth the glory of God as long as two things are true. Number one, it's available. And number two, it's clean. And I believe that uh, this is something like, intended to be, something like what happened at the burning bush with Moses. Remember Moses was going along and there was acacia, acacia bushes everywhere, thousands, thousands of them. He'd seen them, he'd been out there 40 years with the sheep. When all of a sudden, he sees one acacia bush that is, has this roaring fire in it, but it's not consumed. And Moses goes to check it out, and when he gets over there, God calls out and says, take your sandals off your feet. So the ground on which you walk is holy ground. And there God revealed himself to Moses. And in that case, he showed any old bush will do, as long as it's available. You see? But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the surpassing greatness of the power may, and I'm going to give you a literal translation from the original Greek here, that the surpassing greatness of the power may show to be from God and not from ourselves. So what is it saying here? We have the treasure of God working in these earthen vessels through acts of power in order that he may show that this power is not coming from us, but from the God who dwells in us through the Holy Spirit. And that is what God wants to do with each and every one of us. We have this power in earthen vessels. And he wants us to develop such a passion to want to live by this means that we will not rest until we find it if we haven't found it already.
that we need to believe God and to know that there's more, much, much more in this Christian life than most Christians ever find. And uh, that's something that we should never let go of. You know, I'm getting older, obviously, but the, the little ditty that I learned as a brand new Christian, I find these days it comes to me frequently, every day, and especially lately. It's like, like the Lord Jesus just kind of whispers it in my ears. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And you think about the accomplishments of people that we admire, the things that we might want to trade places with somebody to experience and so forth. When you boil it all down, what does it all mean? Because truly, only one life, and it'll soon be passed. Only what we do for Christ will last. And I believe God, as no other generation, is challenging this one to make our remaining moments in this world count. Because whatever we strive for, if it isn't somehow going to count for Christ, you're going to leave it behind. You know, they say you can't take anything with you. Well, a Christian can. Every time you believe God, every time you, you uh, are hit with some kind of a blow and, and uh, it's some circumstance over which you have no control and instead of panicking and falling apart you claim a promise of God and believe God and rest in God and his promise every time you do that there's going to be an re eternal reward for that every time we snatch the opportunity and I don't mean be impolite or push people but to look for and, and to seek to take uh, opportunity to share how Jesus Christ died for a person and to tell them about the fact that Jesus loved them and died for their sins in order that they could have a pardon for their sins. And you challenge them to receive that. Hey, you're going to receive a reward forever every time that happens. Every time you reach out to help someone who can't repay you, you're going to get an eternal reward for that. Now, I want to quickly go to the last part of this John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. During the feast, many believed in his name, beholding his sameons, which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And he knew, and because he did not need anyone to bear witness concerning man, for he himself knew what is in man. What caused this to be written? Well, let's read just before this. In verse 13, the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated. And he made a scourge or a whip of cards and he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers, overturned their tables. And to those who were selling doves, he said, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a house of merchandise. His disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal for thy house will consume me. The Jews therefore answered and said to him, What sign do you show to us, seeing that you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews therefore said to 
uh, said, it took 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Now, you know, this is something that uh, brings out a side of Jesus' human nature that we often miss. And that's where, why I really think we need to think about this last part before I close. For instance, why did Jesus get virtually violent? I mean, he was infuriated. And he, he went in. Now, you have to know the structure and the layout of the temple. The temple had three different areas inside the walls. The first part of the wall was called the court of the Gentiles. The next court was only, only uh, an Israelite could go into, and the next part only priests could go into. But God did in his grace include a court for the Gentiles to show that he loved the Gentiles. And during the Old Testament times, he wanted to draw the Gentiles into the salvation that he had uh, vouchsafed with the Israelites. Well, in the court of the Gentiles, the religious leaders showed their scorn for the Gentiles by putting making it the grand bazaar. It was a bazaar of all kinds of merchandise. But you see, that even that is too tame to understand what was really going on. You see, when it, the reason it says Jesus knew what was in man is because of what he just did with this. I want you to note one thing. When Jesus... He went in, he was taking those guys and throwing them by the seat of their pants out of there. He was going, he was running like a, like a man possessed, and he was possessed with the zeal of his father's house. He was turning those tables over. He was driving the sheep out. He was throwing their money all over the place and drove them. You notice not one person tried to physically stop him. Not one. How I would love to have been there. <laughs> one of those times that I really would like to have been there. I would love to have seen uh, the fire in his eyes of a holy indignance at what they were doing. I would love to have seen the vehement passion for the holiness of his father's house. No one else could call that temple his father's house like he could because he was the son of the God who had revealed that temple and supervised and instructed exactly how it was to be built and everything else so that men could approach him. Why was he so infuriated? I would love to have seen the fearless courage he demonstrated. He wasn't afraid of anybody. And no one dared to stop him physically. And this tells us something about Jesus. You know, you always see hanging on the cross the artist's rendition of Jesus. Looks like a woman with a beard on him. That is not the Jesus of these Gospels. Jesus was a carpenter. You think of the car, oh yeah, well he'd go down to Home Depot or Lowe's and he'd buy fin already finished lumber and bring it out and he'd have electrical tools and all that. No, a carpenter in that day had to cut down a tree, split the tree, smooth it, carry it, and do all of that with crude hand tools. Now, what kind of a physical specimen would that produce? He certainly wouldn't be a womanly looking man, I'll tell you that. Rugged. 
And I believe Jesus was a muscular, rugged-looking man. I don't believe he had the, the drop-dead gorgeous looks of a matinee idol. I believe he had a very attractive face because of uh, his, his character and his, his wonderful disposition and so forth. And I just believe that we learned something about Jesus here that really endears him to me. He was fearless. And he, in, when he had righteous indignation, don't get in his way. But in the midst of that was a man who was inseparably united with the God who created this universe, the second person of the Godhead. What a person. There's no one like him. There's no one like him. And when we finish the Gospel of John here, I think you will see as never before what a unique and wonderful person Jesus, the Messiah, is. And it's my prayer that this will result in all of us loving him much more than we do now.